One of the first videos on my channel featured this machine in a cameo appearance, but I'm going to make a proper video of it now. This is an old XT clone, uh, IBM XT clone. It's uh, 8088 or 8086 actually, uh, running I believe at uh, 4.77 or 8 megahertz switchable. And a lot of people have asked, what do you do with an old PC? Well, if you Google that, you'll find some things that you can find to do with an old PC. But what do you do with a really old PC like this? Well, you can make a clock out of it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to boot this up and run it through its paces for you. I'll set the tripod up so you can see uh, just what's going on on the screen. Uh, before I do that, I just want to explain uh, a couple things here. This does have a tape backup drive. I've never used it. Uh, I believe it did come with a hard drive in it, but that hard drive was toast, unfortunately, and could not be revived even after I opened it and tried to make it work again. So all I'm left with is a five and a quarter inch floppy 360K double-sided. There's not really a lot you could fit in there, especially when you insist upon running uh, the latest operating system that was available really for this, which was DOS or MS DOS 6.22, which is exactly what I'm running. Uh, being an XT class machine, you need a keyboard that uh, will work with that. Now, this particular one is uh, actually more of an AT style uh, because it does have the keyboard uh, indicator LEDs. This particular keyboard was off an old InfoTrack machine. I know the lighting is poor, but you can probably see uh, the special search keys, the red enter key, and a couple of other. Uh, color-coded keys there. So what I'm going to do now is boot it up and uh, basically I'll explain what's happening uh, as it does that. Okay, I have the screen on. Now I'm going to fire the system up. I currently have the system running in 4.77 megahertz mode just so you can uh, really get the full effect of how a pretty much useless machine is going to work. The buzz sound you heard was the uh, the tape backup drive in there. Currently the system is booting MS-DOS 6.22. Command interpreter is loaded. It's loading config sys to load the driver for the RAM drive. It's allocated some RAM to that and now it is currently going to unzip the file that is on the disk to that RAM drive which you'll see in just a second here. Plots.zip, and you'll notice that we have a number of uh, utilities on there, such as Centurion. You'll also see PowerHour.bat, uh, which we use for those particular events as such. Right now it's decoding uh, or inflating GW Basic, which is going to be used for the Basic Clock program, which is going to be the first one uh, that loads up here. As you can see, it does take some time for this, and GW Basic is about an 80 kilobyte file. Uh, you will see uh, that there are going to be other files here also that are uh, a bit larger, such as this one, mistimeb.exe. Now that it's extracted all of that, it's going to run that time B fi uh, file there. And it's contacting uh, the National Institute of Standards and Time in Colorado. We're currently connected at 300 BPS, or in this case, you could actually say 300 baud. And what the system is doing is it's pulling a timestamp down from there. Uh, this is connected over a dial-up modem, as you heard. Uh, however, it is on a voice over IP line, so it's using my high-speed internet anyway. The asterisk at the end of each line is the on-time mark in this program. It delays the transmission of each of these by 45 milliseconds. Uh, to ensure that the on-time uh, mark arrives at the right particular time to allow for delay in transmission. After a number of samples, it sets the clock, and after that's all uh, 
set and good. It's going to just uh, load up the GW Basic program and load up clock.bas. And there you are. This is what you've seen in a lot of the videos if you are watching them, which you should be. Uh, this just runs in BASIC of any variety. I just use GW BASIC because it's handy. And it's just a clock as you've seen. We'll exit out of that with the space bar. Now it's going to load SimCGA. That's a CGA emulator. This system is equipped with a Hercules graphics card and obviously a monochrome monitor. This happens to be a brother monitor, uh, which was actually part of a uh, word processing system. Uh, I believe it actually had a daisy wheel printer. I no longer have that piece of it. I just have the screen. And this works fine with uh, MDA text only or Hercules. So, uh, the reason why this clock had drawn in slowly is because SimCGA is running. And you can see it just changed there. It was very slow. Uh, I happen to like the effect of it. I do not know if that's because of this particular machine or just in the way this particular program, which is still a text-only program, uh, handles when being run under SimCGA. Uh, I know if I do run the program without SimCGA loaded, the numbers update real quick and just display right on there. Uh, anyway, we're going to exit this one now. The little blip you saw in the upper right corner was the RAM drive being accessed. It displays one of four characters up there. And here you can get an idea of what SimCGA does. The actual hands of the clock, the hour and minute hands, as you see just updated, are in white if you were seeing this on a CGA display, so they appear the brightest. Uh, the second hand, I forget exactly what color it is, but it is different from the actual numbers going around the clock. And you can see that uh, the little lines that make up all of those numbers and that uh, second hand are uh, basically stepped. Cyan will be in one particular configuration, and magenta will be one pixel offset from that to give you uh, some distinction if you happen to have graphics that uh, intermingle the two. So we're going to exit this program. I don't know what the garbage is there. Here's another clock. Nothing real special. This one does display the date for what it's worth. And in the center of this clock you can make out a colon, an 88, and a colon. And what that is is simply burn-in from the first clock program, which I normally leave it set to because I happen to like that one the best. Uh, that's burn-in, which was very common on these type of screens. Um, you would see this all over the place uh, back in businesses uh, in the 80s that would leave their terminals powered up over the weekend. Uh, typically the main menu or what have you would end up getting burned into the screen. This also still happens with LCD monitors and also with plasma screens as well. So you do want to be careful about that. I find it surprising that uh, that is actually burned in because uh, this system will typically only run that clock for maybe six to eight hours once or maybe twice a week. But I guess maybe that's what businesses had going on also. The reason why that's there is the reason we now have screensavers to prevent burn-in from happening on your screen. Although uh, these days it's largely unnecessary. We'll exit that and what we have here is just a uh, random floating display on the screen that just uh, is basically a screensaver if you will and uh, that's all it is. You can of course still see the burn-in uh, where appropriate and you can see the different shades it's producing uh, because it is emulating CGA. Now the next program I'm going to run uh, is actually a Hercules compatible program that will also run on CGA uh, or EGA, VGA, etc. Uh, if you have this in uh, Hercules, obviously you'll see it as it's going to be displayed. If you have this on a CGA monitor, of course, you're limited to uh, simply 
uh, white, I believe, only uh, in this particular program. And if you have EGA, there's actually multiple colors. Uh, it looks like the gamut of 16, in fact. So now we'll go on to that. SimCGA was just unloaded, and now you can see the fireworks display. This, of course, being more appropriate for the 4th of July. But uh, that basically is that. And this will actually exit even with a non-printing character such as a shift key. SimCGA is uh, reloaded right now, and now it's going to load this. Now this screen that you see here uh, should actually be displayed in 40 column white text with a blue background. But apparently it doesn't know it's running under SimCGA. Uh, if anybody knows what this is, uh, what this screen is actually from, you get bonus points here. A clue would be at the bottom where it says press FN5 for help, not F5. To those of you who don't know, this clock is part of the IBM PC Junior sampler diskette. And if you just extract, uh, I think, BassRun.com and IBMClock.exe or whatever it was actually called on there, I may have renamed it, uh, this is what you'll get, and it will run on anything else. However, you will hit a brick wall, and there is no exit from this. It is asking for an alarm time. It says leave it blank for no alarm. I don't need an alarm, so I'm just going to press Enter. And there you are. That basically is this. This is the last clock I have because, again, like I had stated, uh, there is no way out of this. Uh, this also will display digitally at the bottom there. And another interesting thing about this is, unlike any other clock program, it actually will move the minute hand a half tick once it hits the 30 second mark. And as you can see, it moved it uh, right in between there. So that's basically it. When you exit this, it will kindly wind itself down for you. And now it says, this is not your sampler diskette. Please insert your PC Junior sampler diskette into the drive. Press the spacebar to continue, press escape to exit. Now if you hit the spacebar, it doesn't work, but you can see in the upper right corner of the screen the actual uh, RAM drive being accessed when I do that. If I hit escape, it's to no avail, you get exactly the same message. So there really is no particular way out of this. Control alt delete does work. But other than that, that's what you can do with a very old machine like this. You can turn it into a clock. Some additional points I wanted to mention. I'm now currently booting the system up in the 8 MHz mode. Uh, just so you can see what that's like. And you can watch that while I talk here. Uh, a couple other points. The reason this runs that NIST time program is because it is an XT class machine and it has no real time clock. So that means every time the system is booted up it reverts back to 12 o'clock on January 1st, 1980. Uh, the second thing is the RAM drive, why that's necessary and why it unzips this file is because a 360k floppy disk simply does not have enough room between the system files and all these uh, utilities and whatnot that I keep on it. Uh, it simply does not have enough room to store all of that. But to run some very basic utilities here, including GW Basic and stuff that probably wouldn't need any more than maybe a hundred or so kilobytes of RAM, I can allocate a lot of that, about 320 kilobytes if I'm not mistaken, uh, to be a RAM drive. 
uh, for it to have all of those files stored. And for those who love the dial-up sounds, Even though this is only 300 baud, it's just worth, uh, you know, hearing that for what it's worth because you don't hear it anymore. So that's pretty much it. Like I said, you can make a clock out of a very old PC. You can, of course, set the time manually each time you turn it on. Uh, or if your system is equipped with a real-time clock, then... Uh, there's really no need for this. Uh, of course, if you have a later system, uh, you can have it uh, uh, with an Ethernet card in it. You can have it uh, go right over the interwebs and get the correct timestamp.